Hello, hello, true seekers all over the world. This is Matthew Beavers from Back with Back to the Covenant. So this is going to be episode number two of the Journey to the Truth interview series the Father placed on my heart to start doing. And I'm blessed to have Sean with Kingdom in Context. What's happening, brother? Hey, hey, what's up, Matthew? Thanks for having me on. It's, yes, sir. Uh, I look forward to the conversation. So it's, it's actually really cool that you're the second person I'm interviewing because Wes, as you know, is the first one. And I just want to share, pump it up again, that Uncommon Ground has been a huge blessing to me. Good. And my, my newly, I think the last... 90 days I've been studying scriptural cosmology really hard and that series has helped a lot. So it's yeah. really cool that y'all are the first two I'm interviewing. So if you're ready, let's play 21 questions. Let's do or, it. Or less. <laughs> so, so the name of the series is journey to the truth. So just spend a few minutes sharing your testimony and your personal journey to finding y'all's truth. Sure. 1997, July 17th on I-95 in the back of a minivan in New Jersey on a summer vacation with my father going to one of his speaking engagements. Um, that's where I was. I'd gotten out of a relationship a few months earlier and I was still pretty depressed about it, you know, high school relationships. And I decided that I, uh, I had grown up in church. My father was a pastor for many years. And then now, he, and but when I was about 12, he, uh, or 11 or 12, he started going full-time to doing his missions work. And he has like orphanages in different countries now through a foundation. And so, um, but I'd still been going to church, you know, throughout my, my teen years. And I just, it just wasn't real for me, you know, mm -hmm. until that moment in the back of that minivan randomly, when I just was at a point of sadness and depression. And I thought, you know what, mm -hmm. uh, I had this weird, and I, I admit like the conversation looking back, cause you know, you grow in your walk with the father and yep. you grow in your discipleship and you grow and part of that discipleship is growing in in humility. Right. But I remember well, as a yeah. 17 year old, <laughs> the, the conversation that I had with him in the car in my mind and in my heart was more, it was pretty arrogant. Right. It was like, mm -hmm. it was like, father, I need you. I, well, I didn't say father. I said, God, I, if you're real, like I, I need you to prove that you're real to me. You know, I need you to, uh, to show me that this is real. And I'll, I'll and I remember thinking to him, I'll give this a try. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'll give this a try and I just need you to prove that you're real. And, and I, yeah. I said, uh, I just, I guess this was my internal prayer. Um, and I thought to myself, like, I don't want to be like these people that I've seen growing up that, that I thought it was fake. You know, I wanted to be genuine and I wanted to be, yes. uh, I wanted to know, I remember saying this unique phrase in my head. I don't know where it came from, but I, I said, I want to know what makes you tick like emotionally. Like, why do you care about us? Hmm. Like what, you know? And, um, it wasn't until, 10 years later, wow. um, into my walk with him. And when I was 27, 28, that he answered that prayer. And when I was going through a divorce and I was, you know, a, another moment of sadness and depression. And, uh, and he tough. told me, yeah, it, it was, he told me in prayer one night, um, he goes, you're, you know, this relationship that has failed, um, the love that you have for that person that, that, uh, does not return that love. That's what I feel for you. And this Ooh. is the answer to your prayer. Ouchie. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. And so that, that broke me to a whole different level mm. of my walk with him because, uh, uh, to me on an emotional level, right. I was still growing in my uh, understanding, you know, by trying to read the Bible a lot and, and sure. try to understand it and, um, still going to church off and on and, and just not being, not having a great experience as far as the churches I went to and, and what I felt like I was understanding from what they were teaching. Yep. Um, and so that's, you know, here I am now. Uh, here at 41 and, and I'm teaching the Bible, you know, on YouTube, it's crazy. Oh yeah. So, but that, that was uh, in a, you know, huge broad stroke. That was my, what I consider my most genuine moment of conversion. Nice. I truly got the deposit of the spirit. Cause in that instant, in that moment, in that minivan in 1997 on, on the New Jersey highway, I wanted to read the Bible and I wanted to know the Bible and I'd never really had that, you know, that unction before. Um, and so I did, I, for like the next four hours as we were driving, I just remember reading like four different books out of the Bible. And, um, wow. and then when we got back home from that trip, I just jumped into first John and James and, and just started studying and I, I never really stopped, but how my studying of the Bible progressed is, you know, matured throughout my twenties and thirties, um, in and out of, you know, ups and downs in my walk. So was, yep. thankfully, once I got to the point of my early thirties, I started reading the Bible 
with a, a different focus. I wanted to not to read it, to memorize little passages like you would do in Sunday school. Yep. You know, I, thought, <laughs> I thought that's what knowing the Bible was, was you just nope. have to memorize little passages, right? That'd be right there. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't realize that you had to know the whole context of the passage, the whole context of the chapter, or even the whole book so that you can understand. Ah. You know? And so that's where my focus shifted about 10 years ago in my early thirties, when I realized, all right, I need to actually know the book. Like there's no other book in life that you just read snippets out of and think, you know, the book, you have to read the whole uh -huh. thing, you know? So yep. I started reading the whole thing and uh, in a greater depths and amounts and fervency than I ever had. And it just started opening up to me like crazy. And so that was another awesome little turning point in my nice. journey for truth. Yeah. Uh, so since you're 41, I'm 40, I guess I have to respect my elders. <laughs> oh, sure. Sure, brother. You got me by one old man. <laughs> that's right. All right. So that's why, that's why I cut my hair short. So you can't see all the gray. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. You can probably see if you zoom in, you can see the gray of my beard. Yeah. The, gray, the beard is very unforgiving with colors. <laughs> so how have you benefited spiritually by starting to keep Torah. Has that increased your faith in Yeshua, the Messiah? Well, in my opinion, yes, not just because of my experience, but because the scriptures tell us that's how we have our joy. In yes, Yeshua, in John chapter 15, 8 through 11, he tells you uh, he kept his father's commandments and that's how he had his joy and he wants our joy to be complete. So we should keep, you know, the same instructions, right? We got to keep what the, the, the son pointed to the father and and said he only did and said what the father does. And uh, he tells us directly in multiple places in the synoptic gospels and in John that we should keep the commandments of God from the law and the prophets directly. Um, it's not Moses's commandments. Moses, <laughs> Moses didn't write anything. He just scribed it, guys. He yep. just wrote it. He just passed along the information. He didn't make up the information. The, yep. the information did not originate with Moses. It was given to him by the heavenly creator through the angels on Mount Sinai. And so therefore, our Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, he tells us that we need to keep uh, those same instructions because they're good instructions. So as I've been keeping them and trying to get better at, for one, you got to know them, Matthew, if you're going to keep them right. So you can't, <laughs> right. So it's so funny when you hear some of these arguments that people say, Oh, I'm in the new covenant laws of my heart. I'm like, sweet. Why haven't you been doing the, the fourth commandment? Yeah. <laughs> Why didn't that come to your mind? Like the moment you became saved and got that deposit of the Holy spirit. If, if it's just on your heart already, like, why aren't you doing these things? Why do you still struggle with strife and gossip and envy and jealousy, you know, and anger, forgiveness. Like, you know, and forgiveness. Yeah. Like, so, you know, for, and this of course is where first John one, eight comes in. He who says without sin is a liar. Yep. So I don't want to be found a liar. Ooh. So I do acknowledge that I'm on the, I'm on the, uh, the path of, of constant everyday repentance, everyday, you know, being sanctified, uh, growing in the knowledge of God as first Peter talks about. So that's, it does change you. It gives you more strength. It gives you, in my opinion, it is, the fulfillment of the, uh, the, uh, the encouragement that Yahweh was trying to give Joshua in Joshua chapter one, where he said, be strong and of good courage. And follow he repeated my it over and over. Yeah. Over and over. Right. <laughs> and to me, that's, I love that. He said that because in my experience, those two ideas, keeping the commandments and finding courage, they're synonymous. It is the formula yes. for finding courage is if you walk in the creator's behavior, which are the commandments then you will find courage, whether it's to face, uh, persecution or whether it's just the courage to forgive someone that doesn't deserve it. Ooh, that's so, a good one. Yeah. I'm glad you said on a path because that's why I decided to call this journey of the truth because everybody's on a journey. Yeah. Walking in the scriptures is a journey. So what ways would you say that your life has improved since the father started opening your eyes to the truth of his scriptures and he put it in your heart? Um, well, I definitely, one of the fun things is you get to see through all the lies perpetrated in our culture very easily. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah. And the cut the lie of cosmology has been a huge, huge one perpetrated for several hundred years now, um, yep. on the, on the culture. And so you get to see through the lies, um, whether it's cosmology, whether it's medicine, whether it's a uh, societal behavior, you know, as obviously I a hundred percent believe that, um, the moment that, um, the moment there is a spark in the, in the woman's womb that life has been created and, and all life is precious and it should not be aborted. I mean, I'm, you know, so oh, man. like you, you start to see through those types of uh, cultural deceptions that are perpetrated on society. Um, and, and you start to realize there is a different way. And that way is like, you know, you go um, like, like ancient, you know, like think about like some cheesy uh, martial art movies, right. You know, <laughs> where they would take the young, the young disciple and they bring him to this, to the temple and they would have to teach him martial arts. And, and throughout that, he, they would teach him philosophy. And part of that philosophy was you have to learn the way, and they would call it the Tao, the TAO, yeah. right. In, in ancient Eastern cultures. 
And all, all that is, is basically discipleship into their philosophy and they mixed in fighting with it. Right. Well, yep. Jesus taught us his way, which was his father's way. And that's why he calls, you know, John 14 says, he talks about him being the way, the truth and the life. And that, that it doesn't just mean like you're the way as in like, you got to dress like Jesus. It means like he wants you to act like him, like he's character. the way, the way to live. Yeah. The way to develop your character, the way to develop your relationships in life, the way to handle yourself, uh, the way to live. Like, and so I always remind people that the God's truth, which, is, you know, Proverbs uh, 6, 24, he calls his Torah. Um, it is the light. It is the truth. And it is something that uh, Yeshua embodied, obviously, as he walked around and exemplified all that. But in Psalm 19, I love Psalm 19, one through three, because Yahweh through the psalmist, he speaks about his statutes, ordinances, and his commandments, and he calls them his moral character. Called, and that's what that Hebrew word means. Mm. It's translated to the word way in, in the English. It's, it's Yahweh's moral character is embodied in the, the commandments for righteousness. And so it's like, why would I try anything else? So as you do those, it opens your eyes to, to weed through deception, to weed through your own missteps and your own denial of, of your own bad behavior. <laughs> so I, like, I guess it's matured me as a man, um, as it's a, and I, and it's also given me, uh, I believe it's increased my intellect personally. Nice. And, um, and it's also been the blessing of helping me find a wife. So, um, because it gave me the proper standard by which I knew I needed to become a man for her. Yep. And so then I attracted the right type of woman, uh, once I was adopting this, this type of behavior of the, the creator's behavior into my life and it attracted her. And so, cause that's what she was looking for, right? She was wanting to look for a man <laughs> who had courage, yep. willing to follow the creator's behavior, the commandments of God. And so, uh, it brought me a wife and it also, it, it's brought me a lot of new friendships and relationships because we started this online ministry and we do, we do videos all the time. And we, and so that's a lot of people are starting to catch on and, and it's, that's a huge blessing. So I, I love, and actually, I guess the last thing I should say, what is it brought me by following his truth is this brought me to the fulfillment of what I believe he actually wanted me to do in my life, which is nice. to be a, te a be teacher of his word. And so I actually feel fulfilled every day getting a chance to do that as opposed to when I used to work in like regular corporate jobs and working my way up the ladder at different levels of management or whatever, yep. or when I used to be an investment planner and have my own business in my twenties. And, you know, I'm I sure I was making good money, but I, I was unfulfilled. I was not happy. And mm -hmm. I, I was always thinking about, all right, like, I, what am I going to do when I'm in my thirties so that I'm not doing this now? So, you know, cause I, I never yeah, wanted to make bad. that long. Right. Yeah. I wasn't fulfilled. So he's given me fulfillment. Um, and that's probably, you know, that it blesses you in all these other areas of your life. So. Yep. So being somebody on the outside, looking at your ministry, you are a huge blessing to a lot of people, brother. So. Oh, thanks. And I'm glad to have you on you. It's amazing how you can articulate stuff. Like some people are not the best at articulating, but you, you are a, I guess a mat a, like a jujitsu master with words, <laughs> wordsmith. There you go. That's what I was looking for. Yeah, I was going to say there's a term for that because the wordsmith. Wordsmith. That's it. Well, I appreciate the compliment. <laughs> um, I, I truly just, you know, I know that this seems like a, a cliche response, but um, I, you know, I would like to say it's just the father, you know, blessing me and what he's called me to do. And so I'm I'm happy to hear that it is blessing people and that like yourself and others and who've who's give me kind words and say that they finally understand scripture now, and um. And it's like, it's so weird because you've probably seen some of my videos where I interview pastors and, uh, and oh, sometimes man. the conversation gets a little awkward, you know, because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I start asking them some, you know, challenging questions, um, because they, and, and the only reason I do that is because, and, and I always, by the way, I always tell them in, in my invitation to them privately, you know, before I have them come on, I'm like, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'd like to interview you and I will be asking some challenging questions, but I'm not going to, it's not going to be, I'm not just going to grill you. It's not going to be a berating session. Yeah. And so that's why sometimes you'll see me like Twitch, you know, whenever they say stuff during the interview <laughs> and I'm like, because I hear them contradict themselves theologically. And to me, that's the issue, right? Yep. Is, and uh, a lot of people have told me that I should have been a lawyer. Um, <laughs> But I laugh and I'm like, well, you know, I actually think whatever trait that people think is effective for those types of conversations to be, you know, like a wordsmith of any kind while I'm uh, arguing or rebutting or articulating a, a point, I think it just comes from my love for writing. And I, I've kind of I've self-published two books in the past and I like I have this entire trilogy on the on the, the, the hundred years leading up to the flood of Noah that I'm That's working awesome. on for the future. And so like to be a writer, you've got to walk through every scenario in a conversation. 
So, yep. so it sounds logical. You've got to remember your setting that this conversation is taking place in, which is the context of the passage. You got to understand the feelings of both people talking and how they could possibly react. So that it's believable and as real as possible. So like a good writer yeah. goes through all these types of mental exercises in order uh, to anticipate conversation. So my, <laughs> yeah. when I, yeah, and that's really what it boils down to is like, when I, when I say something, I'm already thinking about like, here are the three things he could respond with. And what uh-huh. are the f- three things I could respond with <laughs> to those three different things. So I'm always anticipating like, or trying to anticipate, all right, you know, if, is he going to say something cliched according to this topic? Is he going to say yep. the typical response or is he going to actually have some, a new creative response I've never heard before? <laughs> And a lot of another thing that really helps me and what you're talking about is that I actually research. So the, the people I talk with, the things I teach, I, I, I never turn the camera on unresearched and what I'm going to talk about. That's awesome. So that's what you Some people do. won't do that. Yeah. And that's, that. you know, my, my wife you, in the beginning, when we first met, I used to frustrate her because she'd be like, why don't you do a video on this? And I'm like, oh, that's kind of a topic that I, I don't know if I, I know it. She's like, what are you talking about? I, you've, you know, you know it. Like, I know you, I know, you know, it. you've talked about, I'm like, well, there's seven different things in that topic I'd have to address. And I only know like five of them. So I need to study the other two. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So like, that's what goes through my head is like, cause I know, cause I, on all my videos, I take live questions. So I know that out of the hundreds of people watching statistically, they're one of those people is going to ask about the two out of those seven things I didn't know. So I better know them. You know what I mean? Yeah, you better. So <laughs> yeah. So that's where I, I research. I don't get on camera and talk about stuff that People have asked to interview me about topics and I turn it down because I'm like, I'm sorry, that's just not my vein. I don't really study that. I don't read, I don't talk about, I just try to research stuff that the Bible clearly tells you and expresses and explains. Yep. And so that's why it's easy to sound confident when you're just repeating what the Bible has said all this time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's funny you mentioned a writer. Cause I've so published a couple of books myself and I'd like to have like a conversation with the reader. Mm-hmm. So it just to make it like conversational and you have to think about all sides when you're doing that, yeah. every, every argument. So here's an interesting question. What challenges have you faced since you started keeping the Torah and just taking the scriptures seriously? Oh, well, uh, biggest one was in the beginning was, uh, the job scheduling, right? Before I was doing oh, yeah. this to the Sabbath. point where now, <laughs> yeah, I don't have a different setup now where I can make videos more often, but back in the day I was, you know, when I first started, uh, I was working a regular job with a, uh, a large company that's nationwide or they're actually international. And so I, uh, trying to explain to them, Hey, I need Saturdays off because that was like a huge deal. Cause that was when you made most of your sales and that was when you had a lot of Ooh. business and scheduling was tight, you know, and just trying to take, especially then trying to take the extra feast days off. Like, you know, right now we're going through this time period of uh, a mixture of uh, trumpets and David Toma, then the seven days, well, the, the two Sabbaths included into the seven day celebration of Sukkot, yep. which is Feast of Tabernacles, that plus the four Sabbaths within this month, <laughs> Empl- <laughs> you know, it's employers don't, yeah, they don't like that stuff. Right. So um, that was a big challenge. And probably the, like the, the moment that I had grown to the, to the point where I realized, oh, wait, all these laws are still applicable, or at least the ones that apply to me are still applicable. Right. <laughs> yep. So like, and the Sabbath is definitely included in that. So like, I need to not work on that day. And then I'm like, all right, I, uh, you know, I, I need to talk to my boss. And that was a struggle. It probably took me two years to get to a place and it, and it required me changing jobs. Wow. So um, it took me two years to get to a place where I could consistently and faithfully and reliably get in a habit of taking off the weekly Sabbath. So nice. and I just bless the father for now he's put me in a place where I can observe all of them throughout the year. And, um, and the people that I work with and the people that I'm in, engaging with. And, and of course my channel, they all understand and support it. So it's oh, yeah. a blessing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have respect for you if you had to change jobs, because that's Sabbath is a huge problem in our society because yeah. they don't, yeah. they don't care about scriptures. Right. right well, so, hey, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say they've, they've taken this Catholic idea and run with Sunday being a typical uh-huh. day off, but yeah, still a lot of businesses even today don't let people have Sunday off. So yeah, I worked at a hospital last year. Thankfully I was able to quit. <laughs> and that they, they're open 24 7 so that's true yeah <laughs> all right so i really love wes's answer to this question so i'm really interested to see how you're going to articulate it just with your your wealth of knowledge of scripture from your perspective okay. what role does torah have in your salvation or your path to salvation what what role does torah have in my path to salvation well i yeah, yeah. i understand that salvation and this is a lot of people won't agree with me and that's fine 
And that's fine. <laughs> a lot of people, and I would, I would challenge them to study this topic, but the moment that you say, you know, Jesus come into my heart, you know, Romans 10, nine and 10, right? Yeah. The, the much you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you are saved. Yes. That's called a conversion moment. Yes. Um, that's different from the moment that you're given your new immortal eternal body at the resurrection. Totally. So this is, there's this two concepts of a salvation in scripture. One is, one is the idea that you're tr- walking out your salvation that is promised to you yep. it, while you're still in this life, as you, you go through what's called sanctification process, discipleship, right? Where you get better at weeding out your bad behaviors as you're adopting the behavior of Jesus, right? You get yeah. cleansed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're washing your mind with the water of the truth. And you hopefully yep. that works out with fear and trembling through your actions and humility. And as you start to adopt the behavior of our Messiah, um, and as, as a result of that, like that is the process of being saved. Like you are saved because Yeshua will, he's promising you, if you act like him, if you practice his behavior, he doesn't need you to be perfect at it. But nope. if you, but if you, <laughs> that's why he's your high priest. He, he you know, makes oh, atonement yeah. for you when you mess up. Um, first time one nine. So therefore, it, you know, once you have that conversion moment, typically most churches will say, Hey, you've been saved. Amen. Hallelujah. Welcome to the family. Be sure to put your tithing in, in the envelope. Right. Check. <laughs> So that's where a lot of people go, Oh, I'm saved. And then they start getting go, but yeah. And I, but I'm still struggling with sin. Yeah. What's they, next? they get, they get frustrated. <laughs> right. You know? And unfortunately, you know, they're, I don't want to, I don't want to knock a lot of the, I mean, there are some churches that, that do have discipleship programs and there's others that just don't. Right. They, they get people yep. saved and then they say, we'll see you next Sunday. Right. And they think that they're going to get discipled just from that little 40 minutes during the Sunday morning message. Right. So this is yep. where, they have a lot of people lacking. A lot of people get confused between the difference of their conversion coming into faith with Yeshua and starting your discipleship process versus the moment where you become complete and perfected by God through Yeshua's priesthood on the day of the Lord, when he raises you from the dead and gives you a new body and a new heart with his laws permanently written on it. You'll never sin again. You're going to be, you're going to be made glorified as Romans 8, 11 through 19 explains. So it's a beautiful moment. And that that's, so colloquially and in our culture, people have kind of taken that word salvation out of its original context yep. and they put it into this idea of your conversion. And it's okay if you do that, just, you know, when you start digging into the actual meanings of the terms, you start to realize, okay, that's my conversion. Yeah. Okay. I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. walking out my faith and my salvation if you're in trembling, but then I'm going to get to the point where my soul is saved from the second death. And that's what's promised to you through Jesus at the resurrection. Yeah, so I, was, I love your answer. And I, I had a, I don't it was like probably 10 years ago. I had a pastor, I, I quoted Matthew 24, 10. It says, those that endure to the end shall be saved. Right. And I talked about being a future reference. Boy, he got hot. <laughs> so to answer your question um, specifically about the Torah and how it applies, or what the Torah just means instructions, right? So that's just the commandments that Jesus taught us to keep. So how does those, how does me practicing the commandments in my life matter to my salvation? Well, it's literally my discipleship. Like, so if yep. someone came into the faith and they, they had a conversion moment and they said, all right, I believe Jesus is Lord. And I want to ask him into my heart. And they said, I want to confess him with my mouth that he is Lord. I want to put my faith in him, but then they never try to adopt their behavior to his. What are you doing? Are you, you're not his right. disciple at that point. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, you know, like I think it's Luke six forty two talks about, you know, once the, once the people is fully trained to be like his master. So if you actually wanted to call Jesus your master or your Messiah, your Lord, but then you don't let him train you in his behavior, you're not doing discipleship, then you're, you've, you've spoken in vain, right? You've, yep. You're not truly sincere, and, um, and that, I'm going to leave Jesus to judge you on that one, but I would just encourage you to practice the discipleship process. And, and I think, Matthew, I think in modern times, that, that word Torah also gets taken out of context and people yes, forget it, that it, it just means instructions. It just means discipleship. You know what I mean? So the Torah in, in my, my uh, path to salvation is my uh, discipleship to be more like my Messiah. Nice. Good articulation. <laughs> it's funny. You just said that the Torah is taken out of context. So that's got, that's a good segue into the next question. What is a common argument that you see about Paul and the Torah? <laughs> um the most common is galatians right and, and it's funny because it's almost like when you see someone that is uh, that doesn't understand biblical cosmology because they're still you know indoctrinated with heliocentric evolutionary cosmology yep. and you start to ask them questions that contradict that extremely easily debunked narrative um <laughs> that, that, yep. that 
you know, the narrative that was created by a cultist and forced on us as children. Uh, so when you start asking them to defend that narrative and they can't, they say it's science, right? Oh and it's a famous common rebuttal. And they'll say the word yep. science without any context, without actually any conclusion to what they're talking about. They'll just say, bro, it's just science. So do you not believe in science? That is the same as I hear oh in, in a Christian conversation. When you ask someone, what, you know, what led you to believe that discipleship doesn't include the commandments like Jesus clearly said in the gospels. And then they'll say, bro, it's Galatians. <laughs> it's crazy, right? It's this yeah. weird conversation where they'll say, have you read Galatians? I actually have a t-shirt I made that says, yes, I've read Galatians. Um, <laughs> <I'm> nice. <laughs> because that's how often people would say that I'm a comments in my video or on, you know, social media things or online or in person. And they'll be, especially when you run into a Christian in, in the real world, like through business or, you know, the store, anywhere you would in life. And I would start talking to them about the fullness of scriptures and not just, you know, the cliched bumper sticker words from church. And yep. quickly, very quickly, they would start to raise an eyebrow and go, have you read Galatians? And I would just laugh and I'm like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, did you know that in Galatians chapter six, verse 11 and 12, Paul says that the people that were trying to to this, the Pharisees party of circumcision that was trying to force his converts to reject Yeshua and go back to Judaism, that they didn't even keep the law and the commandments anyway, oh. <laughs> because that's what Paul taught his disciples was to keep the commandments and the law of God. I was like, did you realize that Paul, the same guy that wrote Galatians also in Romans chapter eight, verses five through eight, he says that those two walk in the spirit, keep the law of God. They subject themselves to the law of God. Did you know that? Have you read that passage? And they'll just look at me like, no, I guess I haven't. I never, I was like, you're filled with the spirit, right? You're all like, yeah, yeah, I am. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. You know? And so a lot of people just kind of deal with the semantic arguments, right? They're dealing with words yep. without, they're using words without knowing their proper definitions. And so this is also what you'll see me do with a lot of, uh, when I'm interviewing theologians or apologists or pastors, you start to realize that I was joking on the wife at one point. I was like, yeah, I think that definitions of words is like kryptonite to to mainstream church pastors yes because you start asking them to define their terms and they they can't and you're like well can you define that term from actual scripture and that's when the conversation goes off the rails because they they have a choice at that point right they can either be humble and they can actually say okay maybe i haven't thought about it like this from this point of view or they can just start into the pride which eventually leads to you need to read galatians <laughs> yeah yeah and he also says something about a schoolmaster too so share, share a cool story you've experienced after you started like really taking scripture serious, maybe a, a fond face memory or something. Um, actually, it'd be the conversation I had with one of Trump's political advisors. Oh, wow. Interesting. Yeah, yeah he, was, really interesting. Uh, he was a, a pastor and a, um, a, you know, a believer, but he was a part of a group of people that were supposedly Trump's political advisors. And, um, huh. and so this was through my, my, you know, when I was promoting lighthouse last year and, uh, doing some marketing for them and explaining, and that led me to several different people finding out about it. And apparently, um, some people in, in the Trump campaign, you know, they are the these advisors and everything. They heard about it because last year Trump was getting banned from social medias, right? Yep. Because the, you know, his, his opposition doesn't like him having a voice. Um, and so therefore they called me and, and they were asking about this new platform that's about to come out called Lighthouse. And so since I'm the only person that had been talking about at the time, they were trying to ask me about it. And that, that phone call led to another phone call, which was this, uh, this particular political or uh, spiritual, oh. what they call themselves spiritual advisors. Okay. And it was the reason why I say it's interesting because I, had I not taken the scriptures seriously and studied to the point I've studied, I would probably not have had the experience I had in this particular conversation like I did. Wow. Because this guy was trying to test me, right? Huh. He was trying to he was trying to see like who's who's this guy? Who's this Sean character talking about this new <laughs> social media platform that that you know wants to have free speech and is not gonna, you know choose political sides and all that. And is this guy just really a plant by the left? You know, this guy was trying to fill me out. Right. He's trying to figure out like, who's this Sean guy. And is he really a Christian? Like what's going on here? You know, what's, cause I told him that I had a, you know, a YouTube channel where we, we discuss the Bible and explain scripture and have Christian content. And so he starts trying to like, you know, drill me 
on scripture, right? He starts trying to figure out what I think about God and Jesus and the whole idea of Christian faith and all that. And so um, that leads to kind of like a, a theologian little mini battle. A, I should say like this, a, pol- <laughs> a polite theologian mini battle. Right? Huh, interesting. You know what I'm saying? Like imagine, yeah. um, do you guys remember, did you ever watch those Matrix movies back in the day? Yeah, I was saying the first three. Yeah, I was saying. Okay, so, you know, in the second movie, he meets that uh, the Asian guy who's called Seraph, who's the protector of that um, of that prophet lady. Yeah, I think I remember. So, him. so he and Seraph, the first time they meet, they're in this little like uh, restaurant, and they they start fighting on top of the tables. And then that, <laughs> that Seraph guy, he says he stops the fight like mid fight, and he says, "Sorry, I just had to just had to you know you, you don't know someone unless you fight them, you know." So like, yeah, yeah, I, I've taken more arts. It is because I've taken martial arts in my life and that's true. Like you really don't know how people react and respond until they get punched in the face and then, or you're punching them in the face. Are they going to lose their cool or can they contain their remain and contain composed? Um, which is, which is what you're supposed to be taught in martial arts is, as as you progress in your skill level and you get you up to black belt, you're supposed to be able to control yourself. Self-control is a huge thing. Right. Um, and so you don't really know someone until you fight them and, that was what I felt like in this conversation with this guy was he was wanting to go, he was wanting to engage real quick to test me on my knowledge. And it was funny because it within like, I don't know, five or six minutes, it was, it got to the point where he not only knew I realized, he realized I knew the Bible and that I was legit, but that I was teaching him some things huh, that he, he hadn't thought of before, you know? And so it was kind of this unique conversation. And then we ended up talking for like two hours after that. And uh, I, but I just ended up telling him, look, you know, we, we don't really want to be affiliated with, with, uh, any political party at all. So we can't really, you know, it's yeah. nice to meet you and everything. Yeah. But we're not <laughs> yeah. really, we're not really looking to be affiliated with a political party right now. So we just want to be, have an open platform for everybody to use so that I, I probably would have not passed that test had I not actually known scripture as I do. And so that's probably my most memorable, uh, moments as far as in the last three or four years since I've been doing this. But even before I knew the Bible very well, I had some gifts of the spirit flow through me when I was younger. When I was like 21, 22, nice. that, ha- that happened multiple times that just like, I can't even explain. I mean, I can't even explain how, how honored I feel looking back that that was happening through me. Cause it was like words of knowledge, right? Cause that just moments of ministry, we were able to go up to someone and just know things about them that you shouldn't know. Right. Yep. Cause they're absolute stranger and it caused them to break down and increase their faith in God or put their faith in God. You know what I mean? Nice. And, and so like that, that to me was like a huge moment because some people will go many years in their walk with Christ and they'll never have a gift of the spirit flow through them. You yeah. know? So it was, uh, it was, it actually got to the point when I was younger, where I asked the father, I was like, this is interrupting my daily life and it's messing me up my job. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm turned into <laughs> like, turned into like a weirdo, you know? So like, can you, can you turn this down a little bit? And, uh, and he did. And it stopped happening. Wow. That's so, very, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. He's a gentleman, you know, he's, he, he's not going to overwhelm you with something that's, that's, and I, cause I just didn't know how to handle it. I was in my young twenties. And like I said earlier, a lot of the churches I was going to, they weren't offering active discipleship. So like, I had no one to talk to about this. I didn't know how to express or, or integrate what I was experiencing into my average walk. It was getting to the point where I'm just at work next to someone at this restaurant I worked mm. at and I'm seeing like their deepest pains and I turn to them and then say something and they just start crying and wow. I'm crying and I'm like, this is not good. Cause then we're both crying. And then people at the restaurant are looking around. And it's like, what happened? Like what's going on? You know? And, and like, wow. and then, and then the, the, the person never wants to talk to me again because they're freaked out because they think I'm psychic, you know? Wow. Well, Cause I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to handle well, it with tact. You know, I was young. Yeah, sure. You know what I'm saying? I didn't know how to, I didn't know the social graces to be able to handle the tact and everything. So, but anyway, the point is um, the father has done a lot of fun things in my life. And just mm. because uh, I, I would attribute it to uh, just an attitude that I had very early on, which was, I don't care if I lose everyone in my life. I just want to know you. That's where it's at. That's the best mindset to have. So you kind of, you kind of answered the next question. I'm going to ask it anyways, just in case you have something yeah. else to offer. Have you ever personally experienced or witnessed a true bona fide miracle? Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, it's not I mean if, they, if you if you call a word of knowledge a miracle, um, one yeah. of them one of those even led to an exorcism about a week later. Nice. Um, so yeah, um, as far as like someone's limb growing back or something like that, no, I've never seen anyone <laughs> raised from the dead, no. Um, but I've seen, um, I've seen just absolutely. I mean, like I I tell you a quick story. Like there's this one girl that I remember very vividly. She was actually in the apartment complex I lived I lived at, and she, um. This, this is where, like I said, I, I was turning into kind of like a social weirdo because I didn't know how to actually do this, this kind of ministry in a, in a tactful way, but she's just walking to her car about to go to work. And I just hear the father tell me, you got to go talk to her and tell her this. So if you can understand the scenario, like she's walking across the parking lot from her apartment to her car, it's not a long distance. And I have a short amount of time and I'm, <laughs> and I'm across the, the parking lot, right? Yeah. at my apartment. So that means I got to run out of my apartment, down the stairs, across the, like, I'm just, imagine her as a woman seeing some random dude just running full speed at you. Yeah. That could be taken the wrong way. <laughs> right. <laughs> as oh! you're going, to, <laughs> I mean, like, as you're going to your car, like it doesn't, doesn't sound cool. Um, <laughs> but of course, you know, I, I, I stopped, you know, a good distance from her and it's like, Hey, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just need to ask you something real quick. And you know, I don't know if she thought I was trying to hit on her or what, you know, I don't know, but all I, I just told her, I was like, Hey, I'm supposed to tell you that, um, that your son is going to be okay. He's going to make it through. Mm-hmm. And his name is Michael. Right. And she was just like, how did you, how do you wow. know me? How do you know my son? Her son's two years old and was diagnosed with leukemia. Wow. So Ooh. I was just like, yeah, apparently he's going to, I didn't know what else to say. Right. I was just like, apparently he's <laughs> going to make it through. Okay, I gotta wow. go. Have a good day. <laughs> oh she's just God. she's just like standing there crying at the side of her car. Like, who are you? How do you know my son? How do you know he's sick with cancer? How do you know he's gonna be okay? And I just took off. Like, I just went back to my apartment. I had no clue what to. I, it was weird, right? I didn't know how to do it. But to me, that that was the miracle of my life. Wow, that man, that's that's amazing. I'm sure she probably cried like crazy on the way to work or wherever she's going. So go ahead. Different direction, I guess you could say. What does your family like to do on Sabbath? We uh, just chill. Uh, we, ch- we don't obviously don't work for money. Uh, we just chill, uh, take the day off. We usually do Bible study in some way. Um, and we just uh, put on praise music or just some some very basic generic music. Or we, we do something outside, whether it's bike ride or a walk or go for a drive in the, in the mountain. Oh, I live near the mountains. So, you know, go for a drive in the mountains. Oh, yeah. But there's, you know, there's a. <laughs> quite, or we'll go to like a hiking trail or something. So just, to, but usually we always do some sort of uh, Bible study and reading of some sort, you know, and just spend some time with the Lord, just make it a day of relaxing. And other times I just sleep. I just keep it simple. I mean, it's a day of rest. It is. <laughs> there is that. <laughs> yeah. So, just, just me and the wife, um, just chill and just do some snuggling, just sleep. <laughs> oh yeah. That's the perfect day to do it. He tells us to take the day off. So that's right. take that serious. So how long have you been studying scriptural cosmology since you obviously do on common ground and it's yeah. awesome. Thank you. Yeah. We, uh, 2015 was when I first was, uh, rudely awakened to this idea. And I say, I say that tongue in cheek cause yeah. there's actually a, another, <laughs> uh, pretty well-known YouTuber guy named Rob Skiba. Uh, I think he was doing the interview that I heard that day. Um, but he was interviewing somebody, I think that was him and that, uh, they were talking about this. And so, I was at the gym and I was uh, just on the treadmill and this came on and I started laughing out loud. And uh, the girl next to me on the treadmill, <laughs> it was like, what's he laughing at? It's like, heck? yeah. Cause I thought it was such a re- ludicrous idea and it was so ridiculous. It was just that in- initial indoctrination knee jerking, but for whatever reason, I didn't turn it off and mm. I kept listening. So for the next hour, as I was in the gym trying to work out, I just started feeling sick to my stomach because I realized what they were talking about as much as I had been reading the Bible for 18 years at that point. Yep. I was, all these scriptures were coming to my mind and huh. I was like, Oh wow, that would make sense for that. And that, and that, and that like, Oh, that, that would be, that would make sense for Genesis seven 11 for the floodgates of, and the water to pour down from above. Yep. That would make sense in Genesis one. That would make sense. Like all these things started Oh, wait a minute, Matthew 24, 29 through 31, when Yeshua says he's going to come back with the angels through the firmament, through the heavens, mm. that would make sense. And so like, I started to realize like, oh my gosh, there might be something to this. And so for like the next week, I was just researching scripture with that understanding that, that, that uh, new 
thought process and I started to realize this is why there were still pieces of the Bible that I, I couldn't figure out was because I was not, and this is what I, I, I say in a lot of my broadcasts and interviews is I say, I was guilty of this at one point too, where I, I had been taught by Bible school and by pastors I'd heard and, and traditional teachings. I was taught inherently not to believe the words in the book. I was taught wow. to believe the book that it's the authoritative and pure and unrefined word of God. <laughs> yeah. But I, but then when it actually goes to Genesis one, I was taught to just immediately reinterpret what it did say in light of what the culture around me had told me it should say. Wow. And That's so a good way to put it, it was destructive to me understanding what it was actually saying. So then I, I had to like literally just say, okay, I know what I've been taught growing up about cosmology, but let me just act like I don't know that for a minute. <laughs> and let me just take, take these words for what they actually say in the Bible and try to draw a picture out of it. And if I did, what would that look like? And that will change your life as a believer oh, in this man. culture. Yeah. Yeah. I've been studying it and I've been spending insane amount of hours the last like 90 days. And it's just the scriptures are it's like a new book to me now. It's, it's yeah. amazing. And to me, the firmament is the smoking gun. You have people that'll, that'll do like anti, like the flat earth is not, scriptural they never touch the firmament yeah it's the one topic that they don't have any pre-programming for because they've all the pre-programming was was so uh the cultural programming with media television and books uh through through state education was all based on the the land trying to show you the shape of the land was curved yep. versus the idea that you're in an enclosed room that they didn't they didn't pre-program for so that's why it cuts right through the indoctrination when you start you start showing people the firmament in the bible and you start showing them in genesis chapter 168 that the firmament was actually given the name heaven Ruh which is raggy which is this <laughs> you know word used over 500 times in all of scripture this word yep. heaven and you're like wait a minute they're constantly referring to this thing they're con like heaven's not some wispy place that you can't touch like it's an actual structure Yep. It's, it's an actual structure that has multi, multiple layers to it that's above us that encloses us. Um, it's like the father built a seven-story house. He lives on the top floor. We live on the bottom floor. There's a basement, you know, and that's where there's multiple levels. So there's a basement one, two, three, and four, right? So there's multiple levels to the basement <laughs> too. And, uh, and he actually designed something with intentionality, right? We're, we were not created in this explosion that's just flying in. Yeah. with, with purposeless, chaotic, you know, uh, motions, he created something that's stable that you can depend on, uh, that's never going to be moved that you, cause you can depend on it. And he created something that he's actually gonna, that he uses to keep you alive. Um, <laughs> yeah. and that he literally is going to use to when he, when he brings peace to the earth and brings his kingdom down to the earth. So all of the eschatology and the prophecy in the Bible Yes. Depends on you properly understanding biblical cosmology. Oh, Amen, brother. Where you go when you die and how it relates to your resurrection also so depends things. on you properly understanding biblical cosmology. So it's very important. And this is where over the last 1800 years, the, the Catholic concept and the Catholic uh, powerhouse manipulative force of the Catholic ecumenical church has twisted a lot of these ideas so that you don't, I mean, got, and a lot of people don't realize that a Catholic priest invented the big bang theory. Um, so therefore they are, yep. they're in full support of an evolutionary heliocentric model. Um, yes. So therefore, uh, regardless of the, whatever minor arguments they had with, uh, people like Galileo or people like that in the past, it didn't matter. They still adopted this, this improper unscriptural view of creation and what it looks like and have propagated that and pushed that for the last several hundred years. So when you start to actually just say, you know, what, what, what did the actual creator say? Like, let me just take his word seriously. Let me look at the uh -huh. definitions of those words. What did he actually say? What will it point to me? And lo and behold, you can't understand a story if you don't know where the story is taking place. You know what I mean? Wow. wow. So I did a video on my secondary channel, Kingdom Cast. It's called uh, Dorothy on the Death Star. So I take Dorothy from the Wizard <laughs> of Oz and I oh put her gosh. on the Death Star with Luke and Darth Vader and the Emperor Palpatine. And she looks really out of place, right? So you imagine yourself looking at Dorothy with her little Toto and her little you know, basket, and she's standing there on the Death Star, staring at the Emperor with Luke beside her. Could you do anything with Dorothy's storyline that makes sense on the Death Star? Right? Because <laughs> yeah. you, can't have a, you can't have a tornado on the Death nope. Star. There's no weather, 
right? There's no magical kingdom there. There's no yellow brick road. Everything's gray, gray <laughs> tones, right? You, you, none of that concept. There's no flying monkeys, right? Because there's no animals on the Death Star. There's, there's no, none of that stuff, right? You can't do any, obviously there's no fields to see a scarecrow, right? Nope. So there's no animals. So you can't see the lion man or whatever. So the point is all the context of Dorothy's story for the Wizard of Oz is incompatible with all the context for the story of Star Wars. So therefore we've been taught all of our life that we're on this ball flying through space with no purpose randomly through this chaotic void of nothingness and that it was all an accident and that essentially morality doesn't matter because there is no afterlife for you. Once you die, you're, you're dead. And our planet yep. supposedly is going to be destroyed by the sun going supernova in 200,000 years. They call it a heat death. And they think that at some point in billions and billions of years, oh they'll be gosh. in an infinite extraction that will then get sucked back into a point of infinite density. Like it's some weird episode of, uh, of Dr. Who. And then, then it's going to explode again, right? This is the theory that no one's ever observed and no one's ever seen in motion, but this is what they preach and what they teach. Cause it's, it's being preached by it's an occult. People don't realize it's ancient occult theology from ancient Hindu Hinduism. That's just been repackaged and, and presented to us today through Catholicism. So meanwhile, that whole context of that story does not fit in Genesis one. So if you're a believer and you believe the Bible is the word of the creator and, and your God and the father and the son are responsible for the words that we have to, in the Bible, Genesis one should be taken seriously. So yep. you try to read Genesis one and then put those descriptions inside of you flying on a, on a ball in space in a vacuum. And none of that works either. Right. No, no, no. Utterly contradictory and utterly opposing storylines. So if you want to understand all the, people, places, and events that are talked about in the scripture, you can't do it if you put all those things inside a different setting. You have to put them in the setting that the Bible gives you, which is yep. in, in a wonderful and closed cosmology. That makes sense. Oh, yeah. So since you brought, since you brought up your backup channel, Kingdom Cast, do you want to talk about your Investigating Babylon series a little bit? Uh, sure. What would you like to ask about it? Oh, if you just want to share a little bit about it for anybody that's not familiar with it. Um, well, it's a, it's a series. It's ongoing. It's not finished yet. I think I've got uh, four or five more episodes here, but it's, uh, I mean, it's basically just investigating uh, the Babylon as it, as it was in the past, as it is currently today. And then as it per, the scripture tells us it will be in the future, yep. uh, because we see, you know, mother Babylon is destroyed in revelation 17 and 18 um, leading up to the return of the Messiah. So it's, it's one of those deals where it was originated in Genesis 11 with the tower of Babel. And then it still goes today, even though that they're not all unified as they were, because after that moment, you know, different cultures arrived with different, different languages being spoken, but the control mechanism and that controlling overarching empiric system um, has always been in effect throughout the years and still is in effect today. And so we talk about that in great detail, but I've, I, excuse me, in great detail. I've taken each part of the series because there's going to be 21 parts each part just basically starts to dig into one facet of that investigation. Nice. Right. Nice. So imagine like you've seen all those cop shows, you know, where they get this big board and they got all the strings going to the different people oh, involved yeah. in the investigation. <laughs> yeah. All the locations. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So imagine like 21, maybe I'll make a picture of this later, but maybe there, imagine like 21 different facets on this big board. And I'm the, I'm the detective that's stringing together all the different, uh, all the different concepts concepts and how it all applies. And it's all in scripture, by the way. So this, you know, and I look at ancient history and I look at, uh, we look at modern culture. We look at everything that's validating scripture because it's clearly seen. Um, so we, I, I dissect the deceptions that are perpetrated over multiple cultures that has always been, and is still happening today, as well as the practices that they're doing. And then also what that leads to, as we see culminating in the book of revelation and then yep. how Part, part 21 will be a breakdown of how all that is going to be destroyed and taken away from humanity forever so that the uh, sun can be king on earth to uh, create peace on earth at the, in, within the new Jerusalem. So, yeah, it's, a, it's going to be a uh, hopefully uh, I had a, a young lady that had reached out to me to our ministry that offered to, to take all these parts once I'm finished and, and help me with the video. So I'm going to reach out to her and see if she'd still like to do that. 
Cause you know, nice. like when you do a live broadcast, you have your opening and you have your questions and you have, before you actually talk about the content, you know, you yeah. got all the other stuff. <laughs> so try to try to take all that stuff out and put all 21 parts of content together into an actual, you know, two hour, um, informative documentary style thing, you know, so that, uh, people can share it. Hopefully you just share it, get the word out, spread the huh. truth. That's because really hopefully cool. you'll, you'll have a better understanding of what you're looking at in this world, uh, everywhere you go all the time. Um, you guys, you remember when, do you remember a couple of years ago when they were touring that big statue of Anubis around? I don't remember that. Yeah. I was going around. It was, it's been about three years being toured around the United States and like in the 2000, early 2000s or mid 2000s. Yeah. They wow. were touring a big statue of Anubis around. So people don't realize that, that crazy. As I, as kind of a, go into great scripture and detail on history to explain in our series. Um, and one of the most recent installments that I did, it was that, you know, Anubis was, he's this, the false prophet mentioned in revelation that a lot of people don't realize. And he was also called Hades to the Greeks and he was called Nurgle uh, to the Sumerians and Assyrians. And so the Babylonians. And so um, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, the people in power of this world, they're actually putting it in your face. Yep. And uh, they just, because when the fulfillment of revelation happens, they, they don't want the people that are unaware of scripture. They don't want them to be shocked by what they see. They have to condition them to accept. And, and there's a, there's an advertising principle that I learned when I previously in my life, when I did marketing and advertising, that you have to get an image or an idea in front of someone eight times within a 12 month time period before they readily accept it or buy your product or, or can remember the, the name of your brand. Yeah. I'm familiar so, with that. Yeah. So it's, it's a psychological, you know, statistic, basically you have to be, have to have exposure to an idea or a concept repetitively before you become familiar with it and you're not hesitant to it. So they're doing that with us, with the world in, in various cultures with the ideas that we see come to fulfillment and revelation. They're doing that right now throughout all the whole world and people don't realize what they're seeing. Yeah. So crazy. Well, my yeah, lovely bride just <clears throat> my lovely bride just got here, so I'm gonna have to wrap it up pretty soon. So, I just got a one question that I really love to ask. What was the chain of events that happened that motivated you and Wes to start the Uncommon Ground series? Uh, it was just uh, I reached out to him, say, hey, "You want to do a series together?" Because here's something I don't I don't see any other people in this community talking about this. What I want to talk about, yeah. what I think needs to be talked about. Oh, yeah. So, Wes had already understood the things that we teach or the things that we review on our uncommon ground series, Wes already had come to those understandings as well. And he and I were friends online and, and interacted and shared. And, and, um, and so like we, we were on the same page essentially on what that, all that information. And nice. so I was like, Hey man, like you look at people out there that are going to these FE conferences that are talking about this stuff and they don't realize that there's seven different layers of the firmament that scripture talks about. They don't realize um, some of them don't even take seriously the idea of Sheol and Tartarus. Some, many of them don't even understand the resurrection. So they don't know why <laughs> yeah. certain things are going to happen. Other people don't realize the new Jerusalem is a physical kingdom. That's going to come down through the firmament. And that's literally the size of a continent. It's going to change the world forever. Yes. People don't realize that Jesus talked about that everywhere he went. So even though there's people out there that have come to this, this, this beginning, that's probably a rough way to say it. There's, there's other, there's other people out there that have come to this understanding that the scriptures mention a cosmology different than what the world has taught us. Yep. That's they don't go too much further past that in scripture. And that's where I was like, here, this is a problem because now you're just getting believers that have realized the world is not a ball in space, but it actually is um, created by the father. And it's, you know, flat circular plane of the earth that's stationary covered by a dome, but they don't yep. realize that there's so many more descriptions to it and how all those are going to be used to, when the Messiah returns and that's seems to be kind of a big deal since the second coming of the Messiah was talked about and prophesied like seven, eight times more than the first coming, you know what I mean? So like, there's a ton yep. of prophecy oh, yeah. in the Bible about the second coming. It's called the great day of the Lord. And it is what Paul talks about in second Thessalonians two. And he, he wants his, his disciples to understand this concept because it's so important to your faith yeah. while the world simultaneously is trying to get you to believe something totally different. So that by the time all these things start to happen that are prophesied in Revelation uh, towards the end, you'll be deceived and not know what you're looking at. So we, we were like, all right, we got to give people all the descriptors and help them. And it, it, it may take them a while to learn it, but that's okay. They'll learn the Bible better as they do. So that was our passion. He agreed with me. And, and uh, so here we are going on episode 21. Yeah. 
episode 21 that's so crazy yeah it was an awesome show last night so oh, this has been an amazing interview i love love some of the answers you gave what's the best place people can find you online uh kingdom of context on youtube yeah for now yeah if you want to go to our uh we have a kingdom of context facebook group as well as well as uh just you know i'm sean griffin on facebook but Kingdom of Context on YouTube is probably where they're going to get consistently notified of when we put out stuff. Is I'm I'm getting weird types of suppression and censorship on Facebook and other social media. So like, huh. but YouTube, we we feel like we're getting it on YouTube too. But at the same time, I have a bigger following on there, so there's a higher likelihood that you might get notified of my videos more. So, all right, awesome. So, yep, yep. thanks for your time, brother. It's been a blessing. I hope you have an amazing Thank rest you, of your evening. Yeah, I appreciate you, and I wish uh, all the best. I hope the Father continues to grow your channel. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, Shalom, brother. You. Have a good night. You too.